when there's no red lines in the sclera, do what you have to do to get minerals into the body. Some people can't drink or eat, but you can lay them in a bathtub, plug up the hole, and soak them in minerals and keep them there and hold points while they're in the bathtub. We've done that with some people. Oh my, Peter. You have a triple, you have a triple indicator. I have never seen that before. That is absolutely marvelous. Hey, that's a collector's item right there. Who didn't see it yet? Okay, we'll take her down to this section. That, that's true. Peter, I've never seen that before. That's brand new for me. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for the thank you for the information. I now know they exist, but that's not in the heart. That's in the thymus, I would assume. Okay, it's from the inner canthus out. Okay, now we're on this one here. That's it. Here we go. I want to trace what I have seen working with patients over the years. People are very sick and sometimes when they're very sick they come in they have very 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 few red lines. And so they start out with number one here where there's just a little tiny line way back in the sclera. And then the line begins to get a little bit bigger. And then the line begins to get a little bit bigger as you come up out of unconsciousness up into apathy. And then as you move from apathy up to grief, you start getting a lot of red in the eye. And then finally, when you come from grief up to fear, then you have these red lines that come poking into the iris. And you have a lot of them not just a few, they're just like a red eye, just like when somebody gets angry and the, the, the uh, whites of their eyes get all inflamed. Okay, now as a person starts backing off from that, you start getting a little hook. You never find a hook on this side of the scale, so to speak. But as people get better, the line withdraws and they start having a little hook. And you know that in that area, that part of the body is beginning to heal and come upscale. And then it gets more like this as it progresses to where you have just a normal, what I would call a normal red line where there's really not a whole lot of stress, but it, this indeed does exist. You have to have a certain amount of stress on a body organ for it to function normally. Okay. Now, here, as you come from unconsciousness, and you're looking at the eye, and you're coming up to fear, the person will have an awful lot of cold coming out of their body, like what we call an endothermic reaction. They'll get ice cold. You'll touch their skin, and they're cold and clammy when point holding takes place. That will happen as you're moving upscale. Now as you come from fear, which is a fulcrum point, and you move from fear on up to enthusiasm, where the eye is clear, but it has a few little normal red indicating lines, at that point in time, you'll have a tremendous amount of exothermic reactions as you move up. Now that's a general rule. Now we've told you that there are seven levels within seven levels. And so you have little mini, uh, mini endothermic reactions within the exothermic reactions and mini exothermic within the endothermic. And so this, the, the rule is one half the body can sometimes be ice cold, the other half the body can be just sweating up a storm. 
and then that'll change. And you'll notice that this will happen for people where one side of the body has been deprived for a long time of, um, of nerve supply and circulation. And, and like one eye will be brown, the other eye will be blue. And you'll find that just cut right down the middle of the body, one side will be sweating, the other side will be ice cold. So you watch for these things. This will help you to understand it. But you take a look at these ideas. Now, I hope you understand what I'm saying here, is that these are all going to be the progression of this. So if I start out here with a little tiny line, then it grows and grows and grows until it comes down and touches the iris, and then starts pulling, pulling back and hooking and gradually going back and withdrawing back to a normal, what we'll call a normal uh, indicating line. Is that clear to everybody? Any questions? Yes, Sydney. Do you want to come up here, please, so that we can get you on tape? We haven't broken a camera yet today. <laughs> Pull that down. If you're at stage one and you start you in, uh, point holding that in the program, that wouldn't continue on into the iris, would it? Is this when it's uh, a neg color? I have seen some lines come from this, uh, not that I've seen it, I've heard about them, where they started from here and they've ended up down in and through the iris. With point holding. With point holding, yes. Has anybody here seen that yet? Peter? You have seen that. I haven't. But some people have seen that. And the lines go right straight through the iris. Now the fellow John that uh, Ian worked on, remember, with the, with the hole here in his obvious hole in his head or the split in his head that you felt there, uh, Anthony? Uh, John said he had one of those, but it had, it had gone away it had gone away prior to the point holding. Now he said he had one of those and other people said they saw it. So I believe that this is something we should look at. Well, that would be an exception, though, wouldn't it? It would be an exception. If you ask me what it is, I cannot tell you. I do not know. I don't have enough background of data to explain what the symptoms are related to that. So normally the general rule would be if you start a point holding when it's at the stage of one, it would recede. It wouldn't continue on like the two, three, four, five, and six and the others. I would say that that would probably be true. Yes, sir. I would hope so. So if it, uh, as Peter had that experience, what would be the cause of it going, when you start at stage one with a point holding and it goes through that whole sequence? Okay. If the person at this stage one is so terribly suppressed and the fiber levels are so far down then we can say safely that everything is coming back in reverse order as the person is healing but how many generations back did that occur for that to be in the genetic energy field thank you that's a question that is a, that's a legitimate question and we don't know okay Anita, next please. Okay, here's the shepherd's staff or the fish hook. So when you see things like this, anywhere in the iris of the eye, and they can be anywhere in the, not in the iris, in the sclera of the eye, and they can be anywhere, just enjoy and realize the person's been doing something right. You'll never find that in a junk food addict because people who have been on junk food, they are in what we call the disease crises where that begins to degenerate downward and you see, and they just go downward, downscale into identification with matter. But when they're starting to pull back up again by perhaps breathing deep or just exercise or eating a lot of fresh veggies or a lot of lettuce and green things, uh, a lot of fruit, then you'll st slowly see these things happening in the eye here and there. That 
does not mean that the person is getting better. But it does mean that if they've been taking a certain herb to help to balance a certain organ, perhaps that organ has healed a little bit, but the entire body can still be going downscale by a macrobiotic diet where there's no enzymes, or by cooked food where there's no enzymes, and the person is gradually dying due to the enzyme deficiencies. Okay? Now, may I have the next slide? Or next overlay? Now, what's this say down here? Heart lines nearly touching iris. Good. This we've gone through. It's not touching the iris. If I had a heavy red line touching the iris, I'm either having a heart attack, coronary, I've had one, or I'm about to have one. Now I'm going to say the same thing holds true to this because I've seen people who are this close to the iris and I would figure that maybe about eight to ten hours of continual stress would bring that person to that point. And so this would be to me an emergency situation to hold heart points, put one person on the STO point, another person on the heart point. What else do you check carefully? Black diamonds in the autonomic nerve wreath. In the left eye at 3 o'clock, in the right eye at 9 o'clock. And you do a very quick check to find out what you're dealing with. Now, you really don't need to take a couple of hours to determine what the pathology of the person has been. But you ask them very pointedly, have they ever been in the intensive care unit of a hospital? If they have, then chances are they are going to go back and re-experience that problem in their heart that they've already had in the past, or they may have already had a heart attack. And oftentimes they will re-experience that heart attack. I, I want to share one thing with you, and we'll get to that. If there's a red blotch, which we talked about this weekend, this last weekend, in the heart area, and there might be one up here, one back here, one over here, and there's big, three big red blotches. That means the person has had at least three heart attacks. This happened to me early in my career. And this happened back in West Virginia, about 1980. And I want to tell you this story because I don't want you to get caught unawares. Um, This, pardon me? I missed something. Oh, that's very nice. <laughs> okay, just like I had a good glass of ghost milk, huh? Okay, this one lady happened to be the mother of the lady that had terminal pancreatic cancer and who had recovered from it and who was also the mother of a young lady who had who was a paramedic who had terminal leukemia who recovered from that and later, later became Miss West Virginia and later became runner-up to the Miss Universe title in Sri Lanka now this is years ago but what took place here was that the mother had had three heart attacks and was in terrible condition at home. And I was asked to go out and help her out, which we did. We took a massage table out, table out there, laid her on the table, started holding points. Within a half an hour, she suddenly stopped breathing, turned purple, and passed out. At that time, her husband just got scared, threw up his hands, and ran out the door. <laughs> About three minutes later, she did like this. <sighs> About 30 seconds later, did it again. 
she described for us then, <coughs> that's a heavy noise, she described for us then her first experience in the, when she had a heart attack and she's in the intensive care unit. Later on she went through the second one <coughs> and she went through that and that was a little worse. And she was probably, maybe for four minutes, she didn't breathe. The third time she went through the same thing and for five minutes she didn't breathe and, and we began to worry about her because she wasn't breathing. She turned purple and everything stopped. And she had to go back and tell us how she was paddled in the hospital. They had to bring her back, you know, and, and get her going again. Now as long as the points were burning, she was very much alive. And she can't, we, at that time, you don't take your fingers off and you don't panic. You just wait until things are done. And each time she came out of it, the third time, all three red spots in her sclera of her eye disappeared. Now, she was about 75 at the time. A lot of 75-year-old ladies there in West Virginia. We worked with a lot of them. She was out mowing her yard, she painted her house, and she did a whole lot of things that she hadn't been able to do because she hadn't got the strength after that. And to my knowledge, she's still living, and that was 15 years ago. Now, this is where you can be of great help to people as long as you don't panic. In Peoria, Illinois, we had a week-long seminar on cranial work. A gentleman who is the director of the Fetzer Foundation was down at that seminar getting prepared for cranial work. We had about 10 people holding points on him, getting ready for doing points that hadn't been done, getting him ready for the work on the tailbone that we had to do before we did cranial work. All of a sudden I heard a scream and this one nurse was down there and she was screaming. She came running up to me. She said, he's not breathing. He's passed out. There's no heartbeat. There's no nothing. So I went back over, told her everything's just fine. She said, things not fine. He's not breathing. He's dead. I said, put your fingers back exactly where you were. And I checked him out very carefully. <clears throat> His body was ice cold like a slab of salmon coming out of a freezer. And I said, just trust me, he's in a healing crisis now, don't worry about it. <laughs> well, you tell a nurse not to worry when there's no pulse. There was no pulse for five minutes. <laughs> then finally, he started to warm up a little bit, and finally his eyes opened. He said, you know, I'd like to tell you a little story. And he told a story how he was out in the very cold winter on a toboggan and had fallen off the toboggan, flew through the air and hit head first into one of these old oak trees and laid him out cold, in the cold. And uh, by the time they got him down to the hospital, he was dead. And he told the most beautiful story of going through this tunnel of white light where he went into this space where the most beautiful space he had ever been and he met all of his deceased relatives that he hadn't seen for years. And they showed him around, no hurry at all, <clears throat> and, it, uh, and uh, told him what a beautiful place it was. He said, oh, I just want to stay here so bad with you all. And they said, no, you can't do that. In fact, it's just about time for you to go back. Oh, no, no, I don't want to go back. And uh, anyway, they took him back, and he went back through the tunnel again. Then he woke up on the table with a sheet over him in the hospital. He came back to life. Now during that time, he, all of that was re-experienced while he was on the table with the people holding points. And he had a real story to tell to everybody. But the thing is, and I don't know what would have happened if everybody took the points off of him where he was right in the middle of this healing crisis. What you do to start a certain healing crisis, you stay with until it's over and done with. Now we did pull a few more people over to gently massage 
the heart points. And we took every heart point we could find and massaged them. And that probably wasn't necessary. But we did it anyway. But he came back. His body warmed up. He went through this extreme endothermic reaction, which means his body was really ice cold. He finally came out of it. Now this was a hot day. This was about 80 degrees. And his body felt like it was about uh, 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 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And it was, it was down below freezing is, is what his body was like. And that whole corner of the room was just absolutely ice cold. And everyone was freezing in that one corner uh, in, 80, in, uh, in warm weather. Now, you need to have this information under your belt because you say you want to learn body electronics. And you start holding points on somebody who had a heart attack. They got these big red blotches in the sclera of their eye. When you analyze them, you better be darn careful and you educate, 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 educate as to what could be do, done to not only the person who's having their points held, but also the point holders so they don't get scared and run out the door when the person passes out and turns purple. Now, does that help you? Okay. Okay, let's go back to one more thing. I remember a, a situation where Johnny Schmidt, gosh, I haven't remembered this for years, the name of this guy, Warren Hill was his name. Warren came up to me and said he wanted to take care of, of Johnny Schmidt's uh, bent spine where he walked like a crab. Uh, Johnny Schmidt was born that way. He was about 76 years of age, and Warren was just a wonderful guy. And he said he wanted to work on Johnny Schmidt's twisted back. Watch my hand, please. Johnny Schmidt would lay on a table. Watch. And his back was like this. <coughs> his back was like this. And then the spine would turn like this. And then come around and come back up like this again. And it turned him about, I'd say, 90 degrees to where his fa body was facing one way. His hips were facing at right angles to him. He'd been that way since birth. So Warren worked on him, starting in the morning, worked all afternoon. Johnny burned. And the hips straightened out, the back straightened out, it came beautiful. And after all that was straight, we were done. At that time, Johnny Schmidt sat up on the side of the massage table, turned purple, stopped breathing, and passed out with no heartbeat. And so I had to get Dan out of the room. I said, Dan, go get me some cayenne pepper. Now, how's a person unconscious going to swallow cayenne pepper? I don't know, but he had a hard time finding it, and that got him. He just was shaking and scared spitless. All of Johnny Schmidt's relatives were in this big room. I told you all of the Germans' uh, families, they stuck together. He had 28 relatives lining the room while his back was being worked on. And I just took one person at a time and had them come over and rub heart points and massage them. Plugged them all in. Again, after about five minutes, Johnny Schmidt's eyes opened. And he started breathing again, gasping for breath for a few moments. He said, you know something? He says, when I was 65 years of age, I forgot to tell you this, I was in the intensive care unit at the hospital. And nobody knew this. I didn't know that. But he went back and re-experienced that on the table while he was unconscious for that five minutes. Now, here's where you have to know a little history about the person you're dealing with so that you're not taken by surprise like I have been on several occasions. Even when they fell out the form, they leave off, they think their heart's fine, but they leave off from their form that they had been in the intensive care unit with a heart attack. Needless to say, for the first time in Johnny Schmidt's life, he was able to walk straight and tall, very tall, and he was able to go to work on a tractor and do things that he has always wanted to do. Now, this is the type of work that we're involved in. Is it worth it? We had over 5,000 people involved just in North Dakota alone in the city of Bismarck. Over 5,000 people involved in point holding. There was another naturopath there that got trained and they took over the whole 
shebang there and, and, uh, and then I left and went to another area and started body electronics there. I think that was back about 1978 up in uh, North Dakota when that happened. We still have people there today working. Look at the sclera of the eye, check the heart out, and if you see in the heart area any little red blotches in that heart area, you have to know what went on or you'll be taken unaware. Is that clear? Is the tape recorder working, sir? Or not the tape, but the... Uh, okay, is this working? Rob, everything's fine, that's on tape. Okay, that had to be on tape because that's part of my experience. Okay, now back here. Next one. Now on the right eye, here's the indicating line here coming in and nearly touching the iris. Okay, don't just look now at the indicating line, okay? Don't just look there. A lot of people look at the indicating line and they go on to something else really quick. But look back along the indicating line and see if there's any red blotches of any magnitude back in here which would indicate a heart attack. Because as a person goes through the healing crisis, the, they will come back and as the heart regenerates, as the heart regenerates, everything comes back and it starts functioning well. Okay? Next. Okay? Now, this is the right eye. Looking at me, my right eye is uh, to your left. All right? Here's the right eye. Forget all of the red lines. You could have a thousand red lines in here. It doesn't matter. What you now look for in the sclera is you look for a little blotch. It can be bluish green. It can be very close to green. Or it can be just a blue shadow. The more defined this is in the sclera of the eye, the more defined it is, the greater the problem will be in the heart area. And here is where we come back to where we have degenerative heart conditions in the musculature. And I would assume that this is where the muscle structures start degenerating down and becoming quite fatty. And it's difficult to get that back to good health over a period of time because you have to work at this not only with point holding but also with exercise. When I had a massive heart attack when I was 40, I was told I could never work again because I had so much damage to my heart. I went to my nature path and he said when he was my age he had a heart attack and his nature path told him to go out and get the hardest job he could find. At that time I went out and I got the hardest job I could find. I became a hot tender on a brick crew. And after about a year, I was 250 pounds of solid steel and my heart was working. But I had to work my heart and feel my heart all the time I was working. And when the pain got so bad in my heart, I stopped until the pain stopped and I'd go and get, and then I'd go and work again. And I told the boss who hired me, I said, look, this is what my doctor told me. He says, you, I'm not asking you for any pay. You pay me what you think I'm worth. And eventually I worked myself up at the age of 41 where I was a darn good hot tender. I became a bricklayer and became gradually a brick mason. And I loved my work. I really loved my work because I felt healthy again. And then I got cement poisoning. That was the end of that. Because once you get cement poisoning, that's, you're gone. And it, uh, there's a whole story there, but it put me back in the health field again. You know, there's a, the world gives you the experiences that you need. But my heart was built back up to where I could, I could take any type of weight, go right up five scaffolds with a big load of stuff on my back, you know, and uh, no problem. And it just you build that body up to where it's just solid steel. But you have to force yourself through the pain 
by lovingly and willingly enduring the most excruciating pain you can imagine, which centers right in that heart as the heart regenerates and heals. If you don't use it, you lose it. And that's what I was told. And so he said, when the pain gets so bad you can't stand it anymore, you stop until the pain goes away, and then you go back and you work it and work it until it's brand new. He was right. And I had this problem. Okay. This is in the heart area now. It's at three o'clock it's at nine o'clock ish in the right eye, and you find it also at three o'clock ish in the left eye. In the sclera of the eye. Okay? Any question there? You find this with people who have overworked their heart, who have overexercised their heart, and their heart is in a state of degeneration. Yes, David? This is a degenerate state. A heart attack is where you have your red blotches. Now you can have the blue blotch and you have the red blotches both at the same time. That becomes a little more difficult. Okay? Yes, sir? You wait on somebody with, um, with a red line almost touching the iris. You, is it, uh, he's got no blotches on his player. Is he going to have a heart attack if you want to hold his heart away? No. If he hasn't had one, he shouldn't have one while you're working on him. He may have had times, uh, which a lot of people have before they have a heart attack, where they have a pain coming in here and then the pain goes away. Ian, you understand that one? There's a pain, and you just keep right on working because the pain goes away after a second or two and you don't worry about it. You've had those. And that's where you have your, cor uh, your, your uh, coronary vessels in the heart building up so that when the on demand you don't get enough oxygen into the area and you have the sharp stabbing pain then it's gone you think well the pain's gone I'm, I'm still alright but that's the first warning sign that you've got a serious problem okay alright next slide overlay now this is a right eye okay now, the right eye is here, right? So what you do is have the person look out this way and then look at the sclera in next to the nose. And if you have a blue blotch in there, this will be in the thymus area. Now, the thymus area, of course, has to do with the immune system, has to do with the lymphatics. And oftentimes for people who have been under continual self-imposed stress where they go and they go and they go and they go and they go like a workaholic workaholics will all have this because they push themselves relentlessly until their immune system begins to start breaking down because the thymus is no longer operating 40 uh, excuse me thank you for your humor 48 hours of continual stress on a person will shrink the size of the thymus to 50% of its normal size. And so many, many people are always going, 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 going under continual self-imposed stress and this will definitely affect the size of the thymus gland. Now if you're going to work a lot, don't ever allow yourself to be hurried if you're going to be hurried, then enjoy being hurried and continue on and get your job done and whatever you have to do. But don't push yourself beyond your ability to endure. When you find a person who has this blue blotch in the thymus and in the heart, oftentimes they have a thought pattern, I have to keep going, I have to keep going, I can't stop, I can't relax, I have to work, I have to work. I have to work, and I have to work. <laughs> and that's the thought patterns that are always motivating them. They can't sit still and meditate and rest for five minutes to find out what little hidden thought patterns arise while they're meditating to see what's motivating their being. And they find out that they're very compulsive when they stop and look at, at what they're doing. I have to work, I have to work, I have to work, 
I have to work just like a robot. And this is where the thought patterns are. You're looking at one. Okay. <laughs> You're looking at one right here. And, uh, and I have those particular blue blotches. I had them. Now, when I started taking time to relax, Anita, I, what percent would you say is still there of that blue blotch in my thymus area? Thirty percent? We're working on it. But at one time it was heavy and heavy and heavy blue. And when uh, Nita told me that, she said, John, you're telling these other people all these things. You've got this worse than they do. And I, I, I began listening to what she had to say because she's a good iridologist. Okay, next slide. You can tell me, you, you can see how much I listen to what she has to say. All right, here's the scleral lines. You got all kinds of indicating lines. And what you'll see here is little blue spots at the end of the blood vessels, or a blue spot just simply sitting out here by itself, maybe another blue spot at the end of the blood vessel. Maybe you just have a ring of blue spots all the way around the eyes like I showed you this weekend. Blue spots down here, blue spots out by itself, blue spot at the end of a blood vessel. If you have more than two, or what I should say, three or more, then this is an indication again of wherein you will have genuine bone chilling tiredness on one thing, on one hand. Your gums will bleed then, and you'll have bruising on the body later on, and after that you'll have bleeding at the rectum. All these are symptoms of leukemia. And what I have found by experience, in every single case of diagnosed leukemia, there's been blue spots up in the sclera of the eye. And there's always been this profound tiredness. The gums will bleed occasionally, every day, two or three times type of thing. You'll have blood on your pillow when you wake up in the morning. And you'll have these bruises that'll appear, these purple bruises that'll appear all over the body. Now, Several of you in this room know what I'm talking about because you've been there. And that's why you're in the health field. Now, what will happen to these blue spots is I tell people that they have a mineral and enzyme deficiency. And that as they take the enzymes, and then I outline the enzymes for them because they usually have a heavy zone 1 ring, and they have a lot of dark spots in the eye and so on, I put them on the lymphatic enzymes for the mucoprotein, I put them on protease for their immune system, and I put them on the digestive enzymes. And then I put them on the regular minerals that you're all aware of. And then if we take those minerals and enzymes after about sometimes three weeks, four weeks, all of the bruising stops on their body. And then their gums start healing, and they no longer bleed at their gums when they brush their teeth. And, and then somebody thinks, when they brush their teeth, of course my gums always bleed when we brush their teeth, okay? Any, that, don't raise your hands if you're the one that has that problem. And then gradually all the tiredness goes away and the person has more energy than they know what to do with. Yes? We uh, haven't got to oxygen yet. We'll get to that. That's another matter. But right here, this is the leukemia aspect. And here's where I want you to get a copy of Marashita's how to cure cancer. Anita, would you help me with that, please? Because I don't have a copy with me here. And every one of you should have a copy of that and read it. Okay, may I have the next, please? There's your blue spots in your sclera. Next overlay. Okay, a little bit up. A little bit up, please. And sometimes the blue spots are much larger, and there are blotches around there. And I find these oftentimes in people with chemical sensitivity. 
people who have been exposed to massive amounts of different types of sprays, uh, uh, where they live next to agricultural uh, plantations and so on, and that these these no are no longer uh, little blue spots. There are blue lines and blue blotches like this. And these people feel absolutely terrible. And as far as I'm concerned, this is a very, very negative pathological condition, which will take a little bit, uh, quite a while to get straightened out. These people are usually full of allergies and sensitivities. Uh, they, they react to just about everything. And especially they can't eat food, they can't digest food. A lot of them live just on ice cream and, and uh, lollies, you know, type of thing. That's the only thing they can get down, which pushes their body deeper into, e deeper into the grave. But these people are usually quite ill when it's like this. But you see a lot of them where they have uh, work in highly toxic industrial environments. Okay, next overlay. All right. If you have a very narrow blue ring all the way around the iris of the eye, this is a good indication of anemia. Okay? When a person is anemic, what is their so-called hemoglobin count? Low. The hematocrit is low. What can you do to bring that hematocrit up? Lots and lots of green drinks. Where you take every type of green top you can get, put it in a blender, blend it up with a little bit of pineapple juice or something, which will swing both ways, either you're toward protein or veggies and fruits, and blend it up very, very good, and have a nice pleasant green drink. And that'll get the chlorophyll in the system which will bring up the hematocrit quite rapidly. And the chlorophyll has exactly the same chemical configuration as hemoglobin, except hemoglobin has as a central element iron, where chlorophyll has as a central element magnesium. And there is a very definite conversion, which we will call a biological transmutation from your chlorophyll with your magnesium central element to hemoglobin with your iron central element. And this is where you have a biological transmutation in the body where your chlorophyll converts to hemoglobin very, very quickly. Any comments or questions? Yes? This here is a narrow, very narrow line around the iris, which we will call a anemia line. Any questions? Yes? Yeah, come up here, please. I want you to be thinking and really questioning things. This is your chance to do it. Going back to the um, blue spots in the sclera, once you've um, put them on the supplements that you spoke about with the minerals and the enzymes and that, what if they're still not getting results in a few months' time? Could that, I mean, are they independent of themselves or could they be related to other things that are going on within the iris of the eye? Excellent question. Have a seat. One of the most difficult things that we have is if a person is getting no results and no change in the iris of the eye, and if body electronics does not work when you hold points and you've tried everything, and still nothing is happening and there's no change, at least there's no apparent change in the health of the person, then we have to start looking and finding out what is unique about this individual that we have to correct. Where did we miss the boat? 
Now on the body electronics end, I have found in some cases there's no feeling down through the body, none whatsoever. And you do the STO point till doomsday and there's no feeling down through the body. And then what I find is that the person needs to have their first cervical vertebrae put in place. And then everything, all of a sudden they no longer have a high pain threshold. They have feeling due to the fingers and toes and vibrating all the way down. And they have feeling in their body with a gentle pinch test which they never had before. And their body is alive and well at that point because now the nerve supply has been blocked off by a first cervical or the atlas vertebrae which has shut the blood supply off to the entire body as well as to the head. Okay, so you may have a problem with your neck and need to have that first cervical put in. If there has been a lot of trauma to the neck, like with, with whiplash, falls on the head or one thing or another, then we might have to have frequent, frequent adjustments on the cervical spine until we get our body electronics to such a point, sequentially down through the list, that we can then get the calcifications out of that first and second cervical vertebrae so it will begin to stay on its own without the adjustment. So this is one thing we're going to be getting into in the classes up in, up in Queensland. For those, many of you are coming up there for the six weeks. By the grace of God, we can survive up there and, at, uh, and, and all through the six weeks and get into the point where we can get the adjustments done and learn how to do those properly. This will be the greatest thing that you can have to help with your people where you don't know how to adjust and you don't have a good chiropractor around you where you live. And I found that to be a major problem because there are very, very few good chiropractors who can do full body manipulation. Now the reason that a lot of them don't is because they don't want to put a person into pain because what happens when you get your nerve supply back to the body where it's been deprived for a long time and you have a series of good adjustments and all the feeling comes back to the body then all the circulation on a nutrient saturation program hits the body, what's the person going to have? Pain. And a lot of the doctors I've talked to don't want to do that. So they're very careful. $35 please, come back next week. And they have that person for the rest of their life. And that's how they're taught to have a big business. And many of the chiropractors in the states who do this they have to make at least a million and a quarter a year US dollars to be considered to be a good chiropractor. This is what kind of pressure is on these birds. Question here, Simon. Oh, yes. The first time I ever had my neck adjusted by a chiropractor, I passed out for a long time and he couldn't bring me around and he thought he'd actually killed me. What would cause that? Well, the very first time I had an osteopath put my neck in place, where in high school, not high school, at university basketball, I had to put my little six foot three frame up against some of these guys who were six foot nine, six foot ten. And so I had to do a lot of jumping clear up in the air to grab a basketball off of the rim. I was a forward on the basketball team. I was the shortest guy on the team. And so I got knocked around pretty heavily. One time I grabbed the ball and I, one guy kicked my feet up from under me. I came down on my head on the floor. Knocked cuckoo. They took me down to the hospital and I finally came back. I couldn't move my neck. I was just had its blinding headaches. My br older brother who is a chiropractor flew up from San Francisco, gave my neck one crack and he said, you're fine now. But he, on the x-ray, it nearly broke my neck. Now, I was out when I had an osteopath about 30 years later adjust my neck again. And it was adjusted one time and I was out for half an hour on the floor. Going back through what I never went back through was a healing crisis at the time that I was knocked out on the basketball floor and all the memory came back. Okay? 
Now when you get a good chiropractor, you'll have a good healing crisis after a good adjustment. Now, that's important, folks, to get a good chiropractor. David. Or Arthur, I mean. <laughs> With that beard, you know, I almost call him Rabbi. John, um, I was wondering if you could clear up something for me. Um, anemia, it's a, a low white blood cell count? Anemia is a low red blood cell Low count. red blood cell count. Right. And what about, uh, I just can't think of the name now, the one where you had the dots on there. That's leukemia. Leukemia. That's a high white blood cell count. So it's higher than normal white blood. Yep. Or anemia is low red blood cell. Right on. Right. Because I know a lady that's got about 12 of those spots in there, and I suggested to her that maybe her white cell count was low. <clears throat> And uh, she had it checked, and she said that it's, it's a little bit above. But uh, that's, that's all she said. There wasn't anything else mentioned. Nothing said? No. Then you didn't have a complete report? She, she went to a, a lady doctor, like a local doctor, and, uh, and that's, that's what she said. It's, it's maybe yeah. a little bit above normal, but nothing else was said. And uh, she apparently used to count white cells when she was younger and uh, worked in a hospital or somewhere there. But uh, I was a little bit confused there because of what you said that, that it could indicate the, uh, what is it again? The, the disease? Leukemia, yeah. Yep. And um, I was just confused after that that uh, <laughs> the report seemed to indicate everything was okay. A lot of times you will have a regular count Okay? Yep. And everything appears to be normal until you examine the individual status of the white blood cells themselves. And that takes about 2,000 US dollars to do that. And when you have that type of a complete individual analysis of the cells themselves, then that's where the leukemia shows up. Right, so it's, it's a higher number of white blood cells. Pardon me? It's a higher number of white blood cells that uh, the indication... Of yes, leukemia. now, d did you get Morishita's uh, book? Yes. Okay, do you remember what you have is an incomplete white blood cell. That's why you have the high blood cell count. Yeah. But that doesn't show up on a normal blood test. That shows up on an individual test where you look at the individual cells. That's an expensive test. Mm -hmm. right, thank you. Okay, sir? Very good. Good question. Kyle, come up here, sir. Two comments. The first one regards the legal situation in this country with regards to the movement of bones. This is something we may want to look into. There are uh, certain vested interests from certain groups of practitioners who have uh, sometimes very sincere uh, regard to the protection of people's spines and things. And they don't like other people thinking that they know what they're doing, even if they do. And so there are certain laws in this country with regards to the movement of bones. Uh, have you looked into that, sir? Yes. Okay. What was your finding? My finding for myself as a practitioner that my in my visa coming in here to Australia, I can do anything that I would normally do in my clinic back in the Cook Islands as a practitioner. With your qualifications? With my qualifications. And I have been fully trained in manipulation in two different schools and I can I'm I'm qualified number one and number two I'm legal because the head of immigration in Brisbane when that question was posed to him he says you are free to do anything here that you would normally do in your clinic and I said how about teaching you are free to teach anything that you're doing in your clinic 
And this is this I have taken uh, literally. I said, are there any laws that would prohibit me from doing these things? He says, no, because you because you are in here on a technician type situation, uh, which is the top clearance you can have to practice in Australia. But I have a limited to where I have to, I can't be here longer than six months at a time, but I do have the clearance to do that. And he called me in and said, look, I've been told from Canberra to make sure that you're in here because you're helping people. He says, we want you here. That's your situation. That's my situation. Now, the people that you teach adjustments to. That's the problem that you have to look at. We and need here, to look and at And here's that. where, if we handle this correctly, which we are doing in New Zealand, okay, and we handle the same thing here in Australia, where we have the organization in Australia set up legally, which it is now, and now we're going to have, have to membership drive and we have to have an educational program to go with it, which we will get clearance for, which will include what we're doing for not manipulation, as we would call it, but by certain techniques of massage work where the vertebrae just happen to fall into line. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> just a gentle stretch. <laughs> okay. Because we're, we're dissolving the calcifications, first of all, uh, which would keep the vertebrae from going into line. Many of the vertebrae go in there by themselves. All right? Now, this is the truth of the matter. The chiropractors aren't doing this I want because they can't. You. Kyle, um, the fact that John can't, uh, sorry, that people here are maybe not allowed to do that, does that matter if they don't charge for it? Uh, as far as I understand, if you charge for these sort of things, then you have to be legal. But if you're sort of doing it in your back room or something, I'm not sure whether that's still applies. Uh, the reading of that states, Arthur, is that if this is something you could charge for and you're doing it, you're illegal. And this is wherein we want to have licensing for everybody, proper licensing within the law where the organization very straightforwardly will be able to educate and monitor the practice of the people within that organization. And we want a very clean non-profit type situation where it's not going to be a money-grabbing situation like you see among a lot of these organizations that are, are, that are set up only for money-grabbing from people. We don't want that. We want a clean, straightforward organization. Second question is more specific to fevers. Uh, sometimes a person has a fever uh, with an adjustment of the cervical spine. Fever disappears in a couple of minutes. Now, uh, I want to uh, just ask you about that, because I don't know about that exactly. But I've watched it happen. We have seen that with the dengue fever in, uh, you know, where people have run these very high fevers. We adjust, we give them one good adjustment, get them on the Schweitzer formula, get them on some, some uh, mature green pawpaw, and uh, the fever disappears within just a few minutes. I don't have an answer for that, sir. Is it good that it disappears? Well, here's what I would answer in that. I would say they're treating a symptom and not getting at the cause. Because what you're doing is you're not addressing the problem of why the vertebrae went out in the first place. You're only putting the vertebrae back in after they've gone out but you're not getting into the cause of the matter by finding out what stress factors or resistances in the human mind would cause those vertebrae to go out in the first place. And so actually what we're actually doing by making an adjustment is we're doing a patch-up job. Thank you. And I'm not so sure that isn't bad because you're getting people up and about so they can get back to their jobs and survive financially which sometimes is a tremendous stress factor in this day and age when jobs are so hard to hang on to. Young sir. Yeah, John, I'd like to go back to the uh, anemia ring or the narrow blue ring. 
Are we talking about reducing that? Because I've seen it in every eye. I haven't seen an eye yet that didn't have the blue ring. I have some that have not. The little narrow ring. Yes. I have seen that disappear. It will disappear. Yeah. Now, I do have a question now for you, sir. Is uh, Maurice back there? Okay. How about B12 as a member of the B vitamin family as an additive for people and also B6 where there are so many of these extreme anemia problems? Now from a medical point of view, many of these apparent anemia problems seem to be taken care of with B12 shots and also B6 shots. Yes, but that becomes addictive. Uh, what I did with athletes was make sure that the potassium level was high, the true potassium, and then the hemoglobin. Because uh, okay, to my understanding, that governs the iron and that governs the hemoglobin. Yeah, do you see the blue ring go away for the anemia? Well, I wasn't looking in eyes at that stage enough to know that. Okay, how about now? Well, I'm not, I'm not in favor of B12 injections. How about just B12 tablets, uh, where you have your B complex? Now what I'm finding is that as we person progresses past a certain point, that the B vitamins drop out. But prior to that time, the B vitamins stay in. We certainly need a lot of the B complex. Okay, now if you have a B complex, which also includes your B6 and B12, I have adjusted this thing over the many years that I've been in this work. And I have this one B complex that I'm using. And I'm questioning it, questioning it all the time. Because I notice that on people, after they've gone through a certain degree of regeneration, that particular B complex drops out. Now how about anemia? And how about B12? And how about B6? Now you say it's addictive. The, the injections. The injections. How about the vitamins where you take it orally? where you know that these particular B vitamins are not, uh, uh, let's say they're not label rotatory, they are dextro they're not dextro rotatory, mm -hmm. but they are the same chemical configuration that you find in food, but they're still made in the laboratory. You still need lots of chlorophyll with that to make it work. Okay, so you need chlorophyll with that that's to my, make the B vitamins work. That's my experience. That's your experience. Yeah. I appreciate that. Let's look at that for a few minutes. Does anybody have any comments on this? Because I'm trying to take a good close look at the positive and negative aspects in relationship to anemia with your B6 and your B12. Carol. Carol. Stay right here, sir. Come up here, please, by all means. Now we're, we're doing some head knocking. My anemia, um, which I've had for, had for many years due to a lot of malaria, uh, I find has improved enormously since I've taken spirulina very consistently for six months, and that's a natural food source of B vitamins. A definite improvement. For how many months? Six months. Six months, and you find that that's anemia is straightening itself out. N how no, about it's improved. In improved. How about what's happening in the iris of the eye? Have we seen that? Um, I've got the photographs from a year ago. I don't. I haven't. I haven't looked. Who would like to take that responsibility and check out the anemia ring? Peter, would you do that? Or uh, would you do that, David? Okay. Would you check that out right now? Let's see what the improvement now in her eye now compared with a year ago. Now, Peter, you stay up here for a minute, Maurice. What do you have to say regarding this matter? You've got probably more experience than any of us in here. About all I can say is what I learned about 45 years ago. <laughs> but you're, um, what I learned at that time and what I'm... I, I was trying to remember what I learned while he was talking. <laughs> that um, there's two general kinds of anemia. One, one is the iron deficiency anemia, which could also be due to loss of red blood cells as a result of either hemorrhage or perhaps menstruation. 
and uh, the type of anemia that they call or have called at least in the past pernicious anemia which is due to a, a deficiency of a, uh, a stomach factor or something that's produced in the stomach. Folic acid. I no, think. no, no, no. That's another kind of thing. The intrinsic factor. And that the uh, a lack of, that, of this uh, stomach factor or intrinsic factor you can ha take all the B12 by mouth, you, which is the extrinsic factor. You can take all that you want. It won't do any good because the, it needs to combine with or be utilized with the, uh, the, the stomach factor or the intrinsic factor. So that if, if you have adequate B12 from a food source, let's say, or from a uh, supplemental source, but you're missing the the intrinsic factor found in the stomach, then you'll develop this pernicious anemia. And in this case, from what I understand, you, you need the injections. Otherwise, because it bypasses the stomach, the B12 can, go, can get into the, into the uh, body, into the blood, without the need of the intrinsic factor. You know what I'm trying to say? <clears throat> How many know what I'm saying? Anybody? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> it's, a, it's something that's apparently produced in the stomach so that the uh, B12 can be absorbed. Well, no, it's, it's produced, it's produced you know, like hydrochloric acid or something produced in the stomach. So if you, if you don't have that produced naturally in the stomach, then you can be taking all the B12 you want by mouth and it just goes right through you. On the other hand, if you get an injection, if you have that problem you, and you have B12 injected into the blood directly, then you have a positive response and you get over, you apparently develop a control on your pernicious anemia. In the old days before this was understood, people died of pernicious anemia no matter how much iron they gave them. But uh, so, there, there is a case, I think, for injections in where the, where the intrinsic factor is missing. The body can't make it, so you can't absorb B12 without it. You look at that then as a life-threatening situation requiring that. Oh, sort yes, of it, is, it, it is, because yeah. uh, 40, 50 years ago, people died from, from that, and there was nothing you could do about it. Okay, thank you very much, now, there, sir. There is folic acid deficiency, too. A, a folic acid uh, is another substance which sort of mimics B12. As you, you can be taking B12 and you seem to be better, and you're, if you have a folic acid deficiency, you will get sick and you can die from a folic acid deficiency while you're getting B12, whether by mouth or by injections. So usually they say, make sure your folic acid is ample before you give B12. All right. Thank you very much. Peter? Um, B12 injections don't work without B6. Um, but originally, when all the research was done on B12, it was, it was taken, it was a natural B12. Can you hear back there all right? It was a natural B12 taken from animal livers. But it, you needed a lot of animal livers to produce enough for injections. And they had some excellent results using the natural B12. But then, of course, now the, the B12 is a synthetic. And this is where the problem comes in in the body, if it's used for any length of time. And I know athletes that have absolutely ruined their health completely by taking constantly B12 injections. And they take it daily. They get to a state where they have to take it every day to... To, and I think then it becomes a stimulant. It's not a. It's not helping the body at all. Thank you very much, sir. Kyle. Speak loud, sir. With regards to the B12 deficiency anemias, I want to tell you about a study that was done with a group of native Indians as in from India. Now, 
This was uh, told to me by, uh, I think, the lady that publishes the Australian Wellbeing magazine. She's the one that did, uh, that read the study. And uh, she said that when the Indians moved to England and various areas in Britain where the water was chlorinated and had a bunch of additives, that this was found to have a destructive effect upon the bowel flora. And that these Indians eating basically the same diet with their lentils and so on developed their B12 deficiency anemias as a result of the destruction of the bowel flora which they decided naturally produces their B12. Now your observation with uh, people's slow response if they're deficient with the acidophilus and so on um, may be closely connected with this. Or if research. they're drinking chlorinated water or even bathing in chlorinated water then uh, this was found to have a destructive effect on the bowel flora. Very interesting. I haven't read that. I'm not familiar with that. Kyle, thank you very much. Do any of you have any other ignorances that we could uh, share with each other? <laughs> this is good. I appreciate everyone talking. Carol, what's happening? And what's the general consensus? Uh, who would like to come up and talk about that and make it a matter of issue? Make it a matter of report? Thank you, Kyle. Okay. I think we're probably confusing the scurf ring there with the narrow blue ring, but uh, it's certainly reduced um, from the photos, because the sclera photos, you can pick up more of the, because of the angle of sh the, uh, the, the flash coming out, you pick up the, uh, the blue ring more than you do on a straight iris photo. But that's not a blue ring, that's the scurf. But you, you, if you look carefully, you can see the blue on the top. But no, that's right into the iris, that's the scurf ring there. But the, the, the uh, narrow blue ring was there, but it's very much reduced. Very much reduced. So congratulations. It's happening. That's good. Okay, thank you very much. Kyle. There's something I left out, just to jump back a little bit. Sorry about that. With the chiropractic profession in this country, there's a friend of mine who gently used to call him, say he did soft tissue manipulation. The word manipulation was not acceptable legally. He now does soft tissue massage. <laughs> <laughs> okay, soft tissue massage. I'm not kidding. It wasn't acceptable. Yeah. Now, he, uh, he does very, the subtlest, gentlest movements. And he has uh, people with their chronic spinal conditions getting wonderful results. And... Uh, quite often getting uh, restoration of nerve supply and tingling and funny sensations, little screaming heebie-jeebies running all around the body. Uh, I, I think it's wonderful work what he's doing, but he tells me he has people from the Chiropractic Association ringing him up, and they're kind of giveaways, and they keep asking, and they keep asking, and they keep asking to a point where it's very incongruous with their conversation, but it sounds like you're uh, moving bones, but it sounds like bones move with what you're doing. It sounds like you're working with the spine and the joints, and uh, he has to be a bit uh, a bit particular about this because he's had uh, certain legal proceedings, and so th they uh, they don't take it lightly in this country, and this is something to look into. I'll, uh, what's our friend's name? Who's the president of the Chiropractic Association Australia? They're in Adelaide. He's in he's in body electronics. Oh, what's his name? No, not Horst. He's a medical doctor. Remember the great big guy with a great big smile there in the seminars? He got up and talked a few times on the conflict between theories and so on, between body electronics and chiropractic. 
Okay, doesn't matter. Well, we have a friend. We'll check him out. He's a president or the past president of the Chiropractic Association in Australia, and I'm sure he would give us... Uh, he didn't qu bring up any questions while he was taking the classes. Some of them get incredibly irate. Well, it's... Um, when the medical profession was uh, uh, suppressing the chiropractors, the chiropractors resented so much that the, hey, they have become what they have resented. And it's, uh, it's, uh, they have put such controls and restrictions on their own organization, uh, which is exactly what they hated the most with the medical profession. And so the, but it took them a long time to fight, but that which they have resisted, they have now become. And that's part of the game. Okay, now let's get down to business again. We have been down to business, haven't we? We're talking about the anemia ring. Next one. Good. Now, excuse me. Thank you, Rob. Okay, folks, here we go. You have a wide blue ring all the way around the, the uh, iris of the eye. And that wide blue ring is now in everybody. Briefly, once again, I didn't really observe this to any degree other than in about two people prior to 1985. And I saw that among people who had chemotherapy and radiation. In 1985, and I put this together just before we came over here on this trip, and I have to admit my stupidity and slowness to put things together. I think I've mentioned before in the instructor seminars, it was about 1985 when I started noticing these blue rings. Is that about correct? Wasn't 1985? 1985, after the Chernobyl explosion, which put radiation all through the Earth's atmosphere, where one of the medical doctors who has investigated this up in Russia found that the oxygen tanks, which were exposed to the radiation, the oxygen was completely gone in those oxygen tanks. This fits Dr. Walter Russell's work who when he said with his work, which I now understand, which I understood just before I came over here, I've, I've looked at it and read it before, now I understand it, I think. We understand in part, okay, and we read it a week later, we understand it in part again, we think, and then a month later we read it again, we understand it then at a deeper level, and then two years later we go back and we, we realize we didn't understand it at all. And this is how we are with things. But Dr. Walter Russell predicted that because of the nuclear radiation from nuclear energy of any kind or atomic energy of any kind, that that would actually cause a transmutation of oxygen into other elements, including inert gases, which is exactly what has happened. And he said that if this continued and nuclear power would continue, on the earth in any form, and you see, look at, look at how many things have radiation, x-ray machines, uh, pico wave machines, etc., which are using cesium and other things that are using uh, different forms of radioactive material. He said that the time would come when the oxygen would be so depleted in the earth's atmosphere that we would have all the cancer and leukemia we would want, would have all kinds of viral infections, bacterial infections, parasites and whatnot, and we're there now. Now we do know that over the last number of years that the oxygen level has been depleted in the Earth's atmosphere. Down to roughly, in some places down to 10%, and in major cities down to 6% of the amount of oxygen which is available to the biological organism, namely you and me. Now in Japan, in Tokyo, they have a little snifter on every corner, you know, to get their oxygen. And uh, this is also happening now in China, where the Japanese snifters uh, for oxygen are now in China also. Now this puts me into a, an amazement here. What do we do?
do as individuals to stop the encroachment of oxygen deprivation in the Earth's atmosphere when some of it is so high in the stratosphere that it hasn't come down sufficiently yet to destroy the oxygen in the lower levels of the, of the oxygen blanket which blankets the Earth. Now the scientists said that only maybe a third of it has come down. What happens when the other two-thirds start coming down with all that radiation that's already there? What happens if we have Muro Roa being ruptured, which has how many Chernobyls? About 10 Chernobyls stuck down there in the ground? And all that stuff starts bubbling up and fracture, through fractures and coming up into the Earth's atmosphere. If Chernobyl will do that to where through the oxygen deprivation we've got this problem. Now this particular blue ring here, which came after Chernobyl, if we keep doing this, this blue ring is going to become so severe that people are simply going to die of various diseases because the oxygen is not there for the necessary metabolism at the cell level. Hey, I'm, I'm worried about this, folks. I'm, I'm not an alarmist, but I'm pointing out what I see. We used to... Let's, let's make this a matter of record. When it, I came first to Rarotonga in 89, there was nobody there with the blue ring. We saw a lot of patients. We came down to New Zealand in the end of 89 in, and were there for a year. And at the first part of that year, we didn't see any blue rings. By the end of 1990, everyone had a blue ring. We went up to Rarotonga, and the only people by that time that didn't have blue rings were the dancers that, that did extensive breathing and dancing and exercise three hours a day.